All right, in this scene, we're going to talk about herpes simplex virus 1 and 2. And we're going to remember that this scene is on the herpes virus because they're protecting the harp up here. There's a harp over here that they're protecting. So harp for herpes. We're going to begin by talking about the characteristics of the virus itself. And then we're going to talk about the symptoms associated with herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2. So first we note the gun over here, gun for 1. And then we note this guy with the shoe over here. These guys are going to help us remember the structure of herpes simplex virus. And we're going to explain what the cow is for. But anyway, so herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2, along with all the other herpes viruses, have an envelope surrounding an icosahedron capsid. You see their green icosahedron capsid. And out of their head, we have this linear DNA coming out. This is just to help us remember the linear DNA seen in herpes simplex virus and all the herpes viruses. So again, the herpes virus is an envelope around the icosahedron capsid with linear double-stranded DNA. So keep this guy in mind because he's going to show up in all of our herpes videos. Okay, now before we look at the symptoms associated with herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, let's note what's going on in the back of the scene over here. So the harp over there, again for herpes, is on top of this tank. There's this tank over here with a Z on it, the Z tank. The Z tank is going to help us remember the Tzank test. These organisms, herpes simplex virus 1 and 2, can be visualized using the Tzank smear, which is a scraping off of an ulcer base for evidence of multinucleated giant cells. And this tank is on top of this dried cow. You see there's this cow that's very dried out and skinny because and he doesn't have his water. The dried out cow or the cow dry is going to help us remember the cowdry A inclusions, which are also present in the herpes infection. And these are eosinophilic nuclear inclusions composed of nucleic acids and proteins. So the Tzank smear and the cowdry bodies are very important for diagnosis. Okay, now let's talk about symptoms associated with herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2. So here we have over here these two guys, and they're really sad because they're being threatened by the herpes simplex viruses. So this side of the screen over here is going to remind us of the associations in herpes simplex virus 1, because he's being pointed by the gun, gun for 1, and this side of the screen is going to remind us of the symptoms for herpes simplex virus 2. Alright, let's get right into it. Alright, so herpes simplex virus 1 is generally associated with oral herpes, commonly called cold sores, but it has a lot of associations, and let's talk about those. We note over here in his eye, a carrot going through the conjunctiva. The carrot going through the conjunctiva is going to help us remember the keratoconjunctivitis, which is inflammation of the cornea and the conjunctiva. Infection can cause dendritic ulcers that have a characteristic dendritic pattern with fluorescent stain. And thus we have this fluorescent stain over here in his eye with a dendritic pattern to help us remember that. One manifestation of herpes simplex virus 1 is gingivostomatitis. This is characterized by inflammation of the oral mucosa and gingiva, and it may be painful with ulcerations. The cold sores that develop, also known as herpes labialis, which develop on the vermilion border of the lip, is associated with reactivation, which we'll discuss soon. Over here we notice saliva drop. That's not associated with any symptoms. That's just to help us remember that the root of transmission of oral herpes is through saliva and respiratory secretions. So don't share your toothbrush with someone who has herpes simplex virus 1. His neck is red to help us remember the pharyngitis, the inflammation of the pharynx, and that sometimes develops in herpes simplex virus 1. If you look at his finger, he has this herpetic whitlow on his finger. This happens when the virus gets inoculated in the finger, and it can be very painful. There's this lobe over here of the brain with a temper, the lobe with a temper, to help us remember the temporal lobe encephalitis. This is thought to be caused by retrograde transmission of the virus from a peripheral site to the brain. And this can cause things like seizures or aphasia. The seizure crown that he's wearing is to help us remember the seizures. Finally, we note that he's standing next to a nerve, a nerve, on trigems, on three gems for trigems. Trigems for trigeminal ganglia. Herpes simplex virus 1 is most commonly dormant in the trigeminal ganglia, and it can become reactivated in periods of stress. Sometimes the reactivation trigger is unknown, but it is often due to stress, fever, trauma. Okay, now let's talk about herpes simplex virus 2 manifestations. So herpes simplex virus 2 is sometimes known as the below the waist virus, herpes simplex 1 being above the waist, and herpes simplex virus 2 being below the waist. So herpes simplex virus 2 is associated with herpes genitalis, in which there are severe painful genital ulcers, and thus we have these ulcerations in that area over there. Extra genital complications in herpes simplex virus 2 are rare, although it can happen. And the reason why he has this little baby next to him is to help us remember the neonatal herpes. Infants can develop herpes simplex virus 2 as they travel through the vaginal canal in an infected mother. Here we have a nerve in this sacred scroll over here. This sacred scroll helps remember this sacral ganglia. Whereas herpes simplex virus 1 was dormant in the trigeminal ganglia, herpes simplex virus 2 is dormant in the sacral ganglia, and it again can become reactivated in periods of stress. 
This may sound a little bit funny, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Herpes simplex virus 2. Herpes simplex virus 2. Herpes simplex virus 2. Why did I repeat myself so many times? Just to remind you that the rec recurrence in herpes simplex virus 2 is more common than in, in herpes simplex virus 1. And finally, viral meningitis is more common in herpes simplex virus 2. I'm gonna end off this video just by making a word about treatment. So there is no cure for herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2. The goal of medications is to shorten the duration and the severity of the disease. For example, a cyclovir is commonly used as treatment for herpes simplex virus, which is an analog of guanosine. Valocyclovir is sometimes given, and less commonly, famcyclovir. However, oral analgesics such as lidocaine can help with the pain in the mouth in herpes simplex virus 1. Alright, thank you so much for watching this scene on herpes simplex virus 1 and herpes simplex virus 2. I hope you enjoyed. Take care.